Hi, you are in the ladies' room with Dr. Danica, the only public ladies' room you can enter any time without ever waiting online. I'm your host, Dr. Danica Moore. We'll be having real conversations with real women about really intimate issues. They may be embarrassing, sad, or funny, but they will always be interesting and informative. You know, like the best conversations you've had in ladies' rooms with your best friends or total strangers and a physician. Please join us. Hello, and welcome to another exciting episode of In the Ladies' Room with Dr. Danica. Today, we have a very exciting episode for all of you, women as well as men, because today we are going to talk about your famous favorite, most elusive organ, the clitoris, and we're calling it Becoming Clitorate. We're talking with Dr. Becky Kaufman Lynn, who is the director for the Center for Sexual Health and Associate Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology, as well as the Assistant Director of the Medical Student Clerkship at St. Louis University in St. Louis, Missouri. She generally talks about all things involving sexuality and says that the two biggest things she hears from her patients are complaints about decreased libido and complaints about painful sex, particularly in her patients who are in various stages of treatment and recovery for various cancers. But today, as promised, we're going to talk about one of the greatest GYN mysteries, the location, the anatomy, physiology, and function of the clitoris. And as I said earlier, we're calling this segment Becoming Clitorate. Welcome, Dr. Lynn. You are in the ladies' room. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me. I'm excited to come talk about this. <laughs> so before we get into that, tell me about you. And how did you decide, you know, this is Women in Medicine Month. Right. Uh, so I'm asking all our women physician guests, how did you decide to become a doctor in the first place? Oh, well, mm -hmm. um, my dad was a doctor. Okay. And so I really, I had an idea of what his life was like mm -hmm. and he really enjoyed it. So I would definitely say that my dad had a big influence on me becoming a doctor. Mm -hmm. Although I took a circuitous route. I was pre-med when I started college, but when I finished college, I was no longer pre-med. <laughs> <laughs> that has to do with the math class, but, um, but uh, so then I went back to school and took the pre-med classes, the science classes that I needed, and eventually became a doctor. So in all honesty, since you've become a physician, how often have you actually had to use calculus? Never. <laughs> That's the easiest question ever. Never. Never. I actually, uh, when I was in college, I had a uh, explosion in one of my organic chemistry experiments, which I am still to this day convinced somebody sabotaged. And they rushed me to, you know, the chemicals got all over me and they rushed me to the infirmary. Oh, Three no. doctors were attending to me and two of them were laughing literally while I had, you know, acid on my face saying, did you ever think you would actually need to know organic chemistry in the practice of medicine? Right. And apparently that was the only time that was ever useful to them. And I can say organic chemistry was useful to me zero times since. Right. And right. that was also my bet noir uh, of my uh, studies. So I think we really we need to rethink some of these uh, requirements. Right, right. Um, I know a lot of schools are focusing more on the humanities. So now you're a professor of OBGYN and you're in charge of the medical student clerkship. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would be so tempted to ask you all kinds of questions about your medical students, but we got to dive right into this topic okay. because this is so important and I know everybody is dying to hear all of the questions that they ever had about the clitoris right. answered. So question number one, what is it? Um, so the clitoris is an organ, um, mm -hmm. a sexual organ that you, you can see it externally when you do an exam or if, if you're the person, you can feel it, you can mm -hmm. see it in a mirror. Um, and it's above, it's kind of where the labia minora meet up at the top. Mm -hmm. um, so it's above where you pee from or your urethra, and it's a very, very sensitive organ. Mm -hmm. um, the clitoris is analogous to the penis in a male. So we all start out mm -hmm. kind of the same, and then depending on if we're XX or XY, we differentiate into male or female. Mm -hmm. If you're female, that area of your body becomes a clitoris. If you're male, it becomes a penis. And just so you know, the clitoris has more nerve endings than a penis. So it's a highly sensitive area. Well, but one of my fun facts to know and tell about the clitoris is that it is the only organ in the entire body 
in males or females that exists solely for the purpose of pleasure. Right. You know, as far as I know, there's no other function right. of the clitoris. Yep, uh, the penis, right. of course, has multiple functions. Right. Uh, but the clitoris has only a pleasure function, which I thought is so, you know, unique and special about it. Right. Right. And of course, when you were talking about how we start out all the same, you're talking about embryo embryonically yes. in development mm -hmm. in utero. And of course, there are some babies who are born who have not differentiated properly, who have ambiguous genitalia, which is also kind of an interesting phenomenon that we're not going to get into. Uh, but I do want to acknowledge that, you know, that exists also right. for people. So why is the clitoris such an enigma? Why is it such a mystery? Why is it shrouded in you know, all kinds of mystique and what's so difficult about finding the clitoris? So I think part of it is, you know, how society tells women, how, what, it's what society tells women about their sexuality. Mm -hmm. um, you know, women are sort of shamed in our culture and hopefully this is changing, but like, if you like sex and you're a woman, oh, you know, you're a slut. If you're a man, you're a stud. <laughs> and there's definitely different messages that people get about sexuality. Um, and one interesting little side point about the clitoris is, it was in anatomy books in the past. And in the 1800s, in the Victorian era, it was taken out of the anatomy books. It, Interesting. Yes. So what does that tell you about female pleasure? Oh, not an important organ. Um, and then it was put back in. Um, but I think that the other thing I think about the clitoris, what I think is really important is that and what I see in my patients is many patients will come in and they'll say, I can't reach orgasm or what's wrong with me. My partner wanted me to, you know, come in and be checked out. What's wrong with me? And right. Cause there's nothing wrong with him. I know <laughs> what's wrong with you, you know? So, um, but when it comes down to it, they, what they don't, they, whenever you say orgasm, as, and they're always thinking from penetration. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of that has to do with the movies, like what you see in the movies, right? Mm -hmm. When you see a couple having sex, oh, they both orgasm together. And the woman every orgasm time. penetration every time at exactly the same time, which is completely unrealistic. Mm -hmm. And they roll off each other happy. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's the message that people get about how orgasm should be. And not all women can have an orgasm from vaginal penetration. It's much more difficult. Mm -hmm. um, but most women can have an orgasm from clitoral stimulation. So when I talk to my patients, I clarify. When you say you can't have an orgasm, you know, do you mean from vaginal mm -hmm. penetration or from clitoral stimulation? And the clitoris is actually much bigger than that little part that you see, the little nubbin, that's what I call it, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that you see. Um, it, it extends on the anterior vagina and then it also extends around the introitus, but the, um, right, so explain to everybody what the introitus is. Okay. Okay. So the introitus is basically the Any medical words we use. We have to explain. Yes. Yes. Sorry about that. Um, it's the opening of the vagina. So if you were looking straight on at a vagina, the opening, things like this. The vagina is just a long hollow tube that heads up to the uterus. Um, the clitoris is kind of up here and the introitus is just the opening. Mm -hmm. So the clitoris actually extends down around on either side of the opening of the vagina. It's mm -hmm. just not as easily accessible because you can't see it right there. So, the so where do the nerves run with respect to the labia, for example? Um, well, there's a lot of nerves in the labia. Um, this introitus is really a woman's most sensitive spot, like right around the opening. If you think about it, the inside of the vagina is not really chock full of nerves. Like we can't feel tampons when we put them in. Like that's not your most sensitive spot. So the majority of the nerves are kind of like right here at the opening. Mm -hmm. And then when you have penetration, it also, you know, that friction moves the clitoris underneath the skin. You just can't see it. Right. And that's why some positions are more stimulating than other positions, even when yeah. you have vaginal penetration. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And some people are aware of that and do it on purpose. And some people kind of discover that accidentally, or maybe not for many, many years. We actually had a guest uh, last week 
uh, Dr. Shannon Chavez, who's a uh -huh. sex therapist, who's talking about how she deals with couples in her practice with these very specific issues. If I had you reversed, I probably would have asked her more questions about clitoral stimulation. Right, uh, right. I don't think that came up in our discussion. We were really talking about it more from a view of 20,000 feet. But today we want to get really close up. Mm -hmm. um, and, and of course, you know, this has become an issue for, you know, many people have heard about this in the news over the past two decades mm -hmm. with reports about genital mutilation. Right. Um, which I was astounded when I learned, I've never had a patient who had experienced genital mutilation, yeah. but I was astounded when I learned that that practice was persisting in certain cultures when they relocated to the United States. Right. Yeah, uh, and of I've, course, I've seen it. yeah. So you have, so talk to me about those patients. What do they lose? Well, there's different ways it can be done, but sometimes they lose the clitoris. So I can think of an example of a patient who came to see me because she had trouble reaching orgasm. And once we got talking, she had had the genital mutilation in her country, in her home country. And, and the clitoris was, you couldn't see it anymore. Like they suture the skin over it. And she was because she lives here in the United States where it's not common, she was so embarrassed about it. She felt the need to fake orgasm because she didn't want her partner to know that you know, she's lacking that part. I mean, it was, it, was, it, was, it was a very sad situation. Did you tell her that millions of American women who are not lacking that part also yeah. fake orgasm? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> it's really, really common. Super common, yes. Um, but, you know, we thought about can you, because sometimes you can reverse female genital mutilation. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay, how? I don't, I don't do those surgeries, but there are people in the United States who do. And, but I wasn't, you don't know how much clitoris is left underneath there. Mm -hmm. So if you go to surgery, are you really going to help? There's just no guarantee and you might do harm because then she creates scar tissue and pain and everything like that. Mm -hmm. So ultimately we didn't do surgery, but that was really, really tough for her. And did you refer her to sex therapy? I did. Mm -hmm. And did you advise her to discuss this with her partner? Yes. Now that's a touchy situation because I don't know the partner. And so mm -hmm. as far as guidance goes, she knows her partner and how to approach this much better than I do. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's a tough situation. That's a, that's a tragic situation. And I was talking to a patient recently who we're going to have on as a guest in a few weeks, mm -hmm. who actually as an 18 year old had a labiaplasty surgery uh, because she was convinced as a teenager that her labia were too long and too big and abnormal looking. Mm -hmm. uh, and what was interesting when I was talking to her, you know, I thought back to when I was a teenager, it never occurred to me in a million years Right. To even look at my labia, let alone question uh, right. whether they were abnormal. And I asked her what motivated her to do this. Uh -huh. And she attributed it to seeing a lot of pictures on the internet. Now, of course, when I was a teenager, there was no such place where you could look at thousands and thousands of pictures and photographs of, you know, all kinds of labia. That just wasn't a thing. Um, but she got it in her head that her labia were abnormal and she had this mm -hmm. surgery and it damaged, you know, all, all basically she says she has no sensation yeah. in that area. So, so I would what a labiaplasty is. Um, so before I forget, I want to say okay. one thing about labiaplasty. I find that my younger patients all shave their pubic hair. Mm -hmm. And my older patients don't do that. And so I've often thought that women who shave are much more likely to notice mm -hmm. that the labia one is longer than the other, which is completely normal. Um, you know, and I think they're much more likely to look at it when, they're, when they've shaved. That's a very um, good point. I was actually, I got interviewed about uh, shaving pubic hair mm -hmm. and actually uh, what, the article was extremely well written and the reporter wrote exactly what I said. Everything was accurate except mm -hmm. the headline. And most people don't know that the reporters themselves, the writers in most publications are not responsible for the headline. That's a totally oh, no. separate person who writes the headline. And usually oh. it's just based on the first paragraph and right. they want to be very attention getting. And the headline that they used was, 
is it safe to shave your vagina? And so of course I went ballistic. Oh, right. you, know, you cannot shave your vagina no, and there's no hair in your vagina. Right, right. And that's not the right term. So I called up and I asked them to change it to vulva mm -hmm. and they refused. And they said, we know that's not the correct term, but we think women use the term vagina right. to refer to everything, which of course right. they don't. And that's one of our big pet peeves on this show is that we use accurate terminology for right. all of the anatomical parts. Mm -hmm. um, so, you yeah, know, the shaving thing is a really good point. And I was thinking about this and I was trying to think, when did shaving your pubic hair become a thing? It definitely was not yeah. a thing when I was, yeah. you know, a young woman. Yes. I don't know when it became a thing. I think I noticed it. I'm trying to think back in practice when I started noticing it. And I think it was, you know, within the first six years or so of my practice and I finished residency in 2003. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'd have to think about that. I don't know what the turning point was or where it came from. I'm sure the answer's out there. I'd love to find out. Well, I have tried to find out and I haven't. So if anybody oh, who's really? listening knows about this, it's, it's actually a fascinating subject. Yeah. I very clearly remember, I'm a little bit older than you are, and I very, very clearly remember being in my uh, nail salon in the early 1990s, and I know it was the early 1990s because I was pregnant, so it was 1992. And the head of the salon came over and she said to me, uh, you're a gynecologist, right? And I said, yes. And she said, can I ask you a, a, a private question? I said, sure. And she said, I have a client who wants to, me to wax her down there. Is that safe? And that was the first time I had ever even heard about anybody waxing right. down there. Yep. And now think about it, you know, the Brazilian and all sorts of variations on the Brazilian, they wax every last hair off. <laughs> yeah, bikini waxes and the strip and you know, the whole thing. And I do remember a movie, um, oh, with what's her name? Um, oh, I'm blanking on the actress. Um, but she's giving advice to a, a, a friend who's a little bit older, who's getting divorced. And she's sort of the, you know, young, sexy, uh, you know, woman who's you know, never been married. And she's giving her advice about getting her sexy back. And she mm -hmm. says, oh, by the way, you know, men now expect everything to be clean down there. This is not the 1970s anymore. And right. I was thinking, what was wrong with the 1970s? Nothing's wrong with the 1970s. Yeah. <laughs> Those were good years. <laughs> So, you know, the interesting thing, too, is I was talking to my husband about this. I don't see men. Right. Uh, but he was telling me that men are now shaving their pubic hair, too. Interesting. And is he a yeah. physician as well? No. Or this is not. just from locker room talk? This was locker room talk, yeah. At his office, they were talking about it, and people shave, men shave. I, I did talk to one guy who did, uh -huh. and this was many years ago. And he said he just liked... The sensation better and I think I remember saying ew <laughs> <laughs> ew why would you do that <laughs> yeah Which I don't is know a medical I expression we'll swing back the other way eventually yeah so you know it's very interesting how that becomes part of fashion and that becomes right. part of culture but back to your original point I think that is really true that when girls are doing this they're more likely to they're be looking looking at their anatomy and hopefully they are especially if they're shaving and putting a razor down right. there right um so you know obviously we don't want any accidents have you heard of the wall of vagina the what the wall of vagina i guess not <laughs> okay i'll have to tell you about the wall of vagina and actually it's the same thing it's really vulva it's not yeah. vagina okay. but there's an artist i can't remember the name of the person who did it but i've seen the, even if you google it you can find pictures of wall of vagina and basically i think it was a she took molds of a whole bunch of women mm -hmm. and then like it kind of like took those molds and posted them all next to each other and created this big piece of artwork and it shows you all the different variants of normal like some you know labia are all different sizes shapes dimensions everything and so it's just this big piece of artwork with i don't know 30 40 vulva on it and i think it's really good just to help people know that not everybody is perfectly trimmed and symmetrical. I mean, we're not symmetrical at all. 
Well, if you think about it, none of our body parts are right. perfectly symmetrical. Mm -hmm. So if you look at our feet, especially exactly. women who have had children, right. uh, you know, generally one foot is a good half size to eat, sometimes even a full size bigger than the other. Or our eyes, or right. my constant stress, my eyebrows, one goes up and the other one doesn't. <laughs> yeah. right. It's right. part yeah. of the symmetry of our faces and our bodies. You know, those of us who are yeah. right-handed generally are stronger on that side. Right. Um, and so forth. Someone once told me about eyebrows that um, they're sisters, not twins. That is a And that helped me not be so concerned about my eyebrows not being perfectly symmetrical. I'm going to start using that to tell women that about their breasts. Yeah. Because, of course, breasts vary significantly yeah. uh, from size to size. In fact, we did a episode about... Um, surgery, uh, cosmetic surgery in teenagers uh, mm -hmm. with Betsy Brent, and we, we called it tweaking the teens. And the number one surgery that has increased uh -huh. in teenagers is breast surgery mm -hmm. in males. Oh, really? Um, yes. Uh, so, and one of the issues is because of the increasing obesity epidemic, oh, right. Uh, right. male teens are getting man boobs. Right. And one is generally not the same size as the other. Right. So rather than prescribing, I always used to say when I was in residency and, and as a young doctor, I've given up on this now, but I also don't see patients anymore. I used to say, I wish I could just write a prescription for, you know, eight weeks of personal training. Right. Or uh, what I just learned actually from my own podcast, which I did not know, uh -huh. um, is that I did not know that you could get a prescription for nutritional counseling that is covered by your insurance if you don't have a disease. Obviously, I knew you could do that if you had diabetes or heart disease or you know, a nutritionally related disease. But I did not know, and I found out from Jeannie Petrucci, who was our guest, um, who said, yeah, anybody who needs nutritional counseling and has decent insurance, you know, she said, depending on your insurance, it will vary how many visits are right. covered. But yeah, I'd like to send those teenagers to a nutritionist. Yes, definitely. So what else do we need to know about the clitoris? Um, well, uh, there are a couple things that I tell my patients uh, who have trouble reaching orgasm. Um, just a couple of things I wanted to mention. So some women are... I usually start with self-stimulation or masturbation if someone's having trouble reaching orgasm. And I usually start with the clitoris, the part that you can see. Um, and there actually is a website, and I don't know if you've heard of this website. It's called O-M-G-Y and yes. Yes. I, I have heard of it because we had an episode uh, with um, uh, Susan um, oh. Kellogg's fat. Yes. And Maybe so she mentioned, but tell the website again, because yeah, everybody should go to this. Everybody should go to it. And basically what it is, it's designed, tell, the, tell the address again. Um, it's capital O M G Y and then lowercase E S exclamation point. Okay. And basically it's designed to help people improve their orgasm. So it's video, real video of women masturbating and all the different techniques that they use to improve their outcome to improve their orgasm. But where I use it, I tend to use it. You can use it that way, but where I use it is with my patients who have trouble reaching orgasm um, because they can go and look, oh, that's a good idea. Oh, I'm gonna try this. So I think it's a fantastic resource. It does cost money to join, but it's a one-time fee. Um, and yeah, I refer a lot of my patients to it. Mm -hmm. Great, and what kind of feedback do you get? Good feedback. I do. They're like, oh, yeah. I, I, oh, patients, that. Yes. Now, of course, sometimes patients, I may recommend things that they're like, er, I don't, I'm not comfortable doing that. And I completely respect that. If that's outside of your comfort zone, that's okay. Um, but I've heard good feedback from it. Great. So we'll well, that's, a good, that that's a good tip. Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking that all the men who are listening are writing this down and thinking. Yeah. <laughs> So um, do you ever see couples together or that's not your thing? Yeah, I do. Okay. Um, so I'm also a sexual counselor, 
Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not a therapist, but I'm a counselor and I've had some training in that. And I think that is so important when you're addressing sexuality, because I see a lot of low libido, which Mm -hmm. could be related to relationship problems, but it also could be related to being on an antidepressant or, you know, you're got I don't know, diabetes or painful sex or something like that. Um, But I get so much more information when I see the couple together about the dynamics of the relationship. And I like that in my training, I learned how to get sort of a more therapy related history. Because as a physician, you don't learn how to ask those right questions. And so having that extra training has really helped me Because if you ask somebody, how's the relationship? They're going to be like, fine. Okay, next question. But that's not really how you get to the bottom of it. So, um, yeah, so I do see couples together, and I think it's very useful. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So what was your additional training then? Because I certainly didn't have this training in residency. Right, right. So I did um, a medical sex therapy course, Mm -hmm. um, and basically I went to Florida for a week. Mm -hmm. And um, we had like 60, you know, continuing medical education unit lectures all day long. And then um, I went back the following year for the second half of the course. Um, And in that year, I had to do 30 supervision hours. Mm -hmm. So um, I worked with a sex therapist here in St. Louis. And basically, obviously, without giving any names, I would present a patient just like we do in, you know, in residency, and we would discuss the case and talk about this and that, what can be done. And um, a sex therapist really opened my eyes to things that I never would have thought of, of being a physician. So that was very useful. And I did some supervision hours also with a physician who was also a sex therapist. So So, obviously that affects all of your patient encounters. Yes, because I ask those questions now every time, anyway. Even if they're not there specifically for a relationship issue, I think it's important to know what's going on. Mm -hmm. I really feel that looking at sexuality and taking care of a patient sexually, um, it's not like in a box. So let's say you're a postmenopausal woman and you come with vaginal dryness. Oh, that, and that's an easy fix. Like we can fix that. There are plenty of products out there to treat vaginal dryness to make sex not painful anymore, but they also may have low libido partially because of their age, partially because sex hurts. So if sex hurts, why would you want to have sex? And, or they may not, they may not be be becoming aroused. So it could be the, you know, the other way around. So yeah, one of the things that I always bad. ask patients um, to determine whether it's a relationship issue, I, I like to get right to the heart of the matter. Yeah. Um, so to determine whether low libido is a relationship issue mm-hmm. or a physiologic problem. Or both. Uh, or menopausal problem, right, or both. Right. Uh, I say, okay, who's your celebrity crush? And that kind of takes them totally out of the right. context of like, what? <laughs> Like, right, who's right. the hottest, you know, person you can think of? Right. And, you know, usually in my, you know, people that I talk to, it's either George Clooney or Denzel Washington. And I have so to throw I, in Jason Bateman. He's my <laughs> favorite a, crush. You have a younger, you have a younger population than I do. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but okay, we'll give props to Jason Bateman. But whoever it is, <laughs> who is the guy who you just think is the hottest guy on the planet? And then I say, okay, if he was in the bed, mm-hmm. would you will have this problem. And when they're jumping off the chair with excitement, just at the thought of it, I'm like, okay, probably not an intrinsic libido problem. Right. Right. You know, now we have to ask more relationship questions and when did this start and, you know, get more into it. But if they say to me, you know, if both of them were in the bed, I would have no interest in anything, you know, then, okay, then we're probably dealing with something that's really intrinsic. Right. So talk to me a little bit about menopause and libido and sexual stimulation and the clitoris. You know, yeah. does anything change with Absolutely. respect to phys- physiologic response? So the most common thing I hear from my patients as far as orgasm is either when they go through menopause, they lose the ability to orgasm at all, or 
they say, oh my gosh, it takes so long. And when I get there, it's like, uh, that was it. <laughs> I'm here day in, day out. And a lot of what I do is reinsurance. And if I say, you're normal, that's what everybody tells me. And um, so I talk about what happens to the vagina when you go through menopause and your body's not making those hormones anymore. Mm -hmm. The vaginal tissue gets thin and dry. There's less blood flowing to it. It doesn't stretch. But the good news is, in my professional opinion, there is a fountain of youth for the vagina. <laughs> and that is vaginal estrogens or vaginal estrogen and testosterone mm -hmm. or androgens. Um, because you really can change the tissue in the vagina if you give those hormones back. And the good news is using a vaginal hormone is not like swallowing a pill or wearing a patch. You know, those have some significant risk to them. But the vaginal hormones are such a low dose that they really work locally. And you can change the vagina. It'll be thicker. It'll be moister. It stretches. And I think um, a lot of times I, my patients will say, oh, they told me to use olive oil. They told me to use Crisco. And that's great for friction. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't doesn't give the vagina its own ability to lubricate. It doesn't bring new blood vessels, which bring nerves. Um, you know, really only vaginal hormones will do that. And of course, not everybody can take vaginal hormones. So, so that's a good point. Yes. Um, so you might be talking about breast cancer patients, mm -hmm. right? Um, so with breast cancer patients, there's a lot of organizations that have come out with recommendations on whether or not you know, breast cancer patients should use vaginal estrogens or, or estrogen and androgen. And most of um, like ACOG, the American College of OBGYN, North American Menopause Society and ASCO, which is the um, so American uh, Society of Clinical Oncologists. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so they each have their own set of recommendations. They're all pretty much the same. They're very similar. And what they say is that you need to try lubricants and moisturizers first. Mm -hmm. If that fails, you can consider a low dose vaginal hormone, either estro estrogen or prasterone, um, which gets converted to estrogen and uh, androgens in the vagina. Um, and also ACOG statement says that we, we've no, it's never been proven that there is an increased risk for recurrence with low dose vaginal hormones. It still terrifies everybody. Mm -hmm. If you're a breast cancer patient, you're like hormones. Everybody mm -hmm. told me no. Um, and some of the products like the, um, the prasterone, um, it doesn't raise the serum, the, the, the levels of the hormones in your blood any higher than the normal postmenopausal range. And same with some of the ultra low uh, estrogens. Um, they don't really, they don't change, they don't raise it high enough to be outside of that normal range. So there, and there are things that you can do for, this is, this is a topic in and of itself. Right, right. right. I could talk forever. Everything we talk about is a topic yeah. in and of itself. Um, right. And we have to get back to the clitoris. Okay, uh, but that. where I was going with this mm -hmm. is what are some of the issues that cancer patients have uh, when we're talking about uh, clitoral stimulation and uh, when we're talking about libido and sexual response. Yes. I remember when I was a resident, one of the most traumatic, horrible experiences that I ever had was my acting chairman was an oncologist and just not a nice person at all. Um, and I remember we had a 24-year-old uh, woman who we did rounds on and she had just had a complete vulvectomy for vulvar cancer. Yeah. Uh, her mm -hmm. whole vulva had been literally removed. Right. And he went through all of these things and he said to her, do you have any questions? And she said, you know, when can I have sex again? And he literally berated her, like almost yelled at her oh, and, and said to her, I just saved your life. And you, you want to ask me about sex? And I was horrified. I would have been horrified too. Absolutely horrified. Right. Um, and again, that was the 1980s. You know, I can't imagine something like that happening today. But I think, you know, one of the fears that many women have when they have any kind of vaginal surgery mm -hmm. uh, or if they have a hysterectomy and the removal of their cervix mm -hmm. is what's going to happen to my sexual response, which is right. a completely legitimate question. Yeah. I think the worst that I've seen is radiation. 
mm-hmm. vaginal radiation. Um, you know, if they've had it for cervical cancer or vaginal cancer, you can give estrogen in those patients, but that tissue, for lack of a better word, is fried. And I, I feel like they have the most trouble with lack of sensation and with pain also when you've had um, pelvic radiation. That's, mm-hmm. that's definitely the hardest thing to deal with. All right. And talk a little bit. We just have a couple of minutes left. I mean, sure. yeah, obviously we've been all over. Talk about the relationship between the clitoris mm-hmm. and surgeries or radiation and pelvic pain or chronic mm-hmm. pelvic pain. Yeah. So, um, you know, when you have radiation, it affects blood flow, it affects nerves, everything to the clitoris. So you're likely to have much less sensation when you go through menopause, you'll have much less sensation. Um, you know, it's, you, in order to reach orgasm, I forgot to mention this, is, you know, you, you might need more stimulation than you can do with a hand or a mouth. And so, um, you know, for people who have trouble or have something that's affecting the clitoris, like the radiation or lack of hormones, I would say those are the two biggest ones, um, then, you know, purchasing a vibrator and using it on the clitoris may help you. There are even special vibrator type products that are designed specifically just for the clitoris. Right, right. Which we talked about with Susan Kellogg. (laughs) Right, all sorts of vibrators. As far as pain goes, uh, one thing I want to mention too for your listeners is that I do see patients who have what we call clitorodynia, where all their pain is on the clitoris. And that it's so frustrating to them. You know, I can think of a patient who was not sexually active and became sexually active and she couldn't tolerate anything touching her clitoris. And so that was, that is affecting her life. And I think we so easily breeze over like the GYN oncologist, you talked about women's sexuality when it is so important to everybody and, and sexuality is important to, you know, your relationship which spills out into your home life and your family. And, and we can't forget how important it is. But so that's another thing that I see as clitoral pain. Um, or we see people who feel constantly aroused in the clitoris. Mm. That's called PGAD or persistent genital arousal disorder. And for your listeners, I want you to know that you're not alone that many people have this, but when people have this constant feeling that the, the clitoris is engorged and they need to masturbate to make themselves feel better, they are horrified. Who can I tell this to? Mm-hmm. They're gonna think I'm crazy, but it, it's real and many people have it. And, and is it treatable? So there's not a lot of scientific data on it. It's only really been recognized over oh, approximately like the last 10 years. So there's, there are no good studies that show that something works. But I have, of all things, tried Shantix. And I've had a couple patients that Shantix works on. Wow. Yeah. I thought um, you were gonna say Botox. No, I have never tried Botox for that. Um, I've tried some, like I do have a patient who puts a little lidocaine on it just to Mm -hmm. kind of calm it down, which is a numbing medicine. Um, I have seen a report in one of the journals about sacral neuromodulation, um, something that they use commonly for incontinence to kind of calm those nerves down. Um, There's not- You mentioned lidocaine. I was talking to a friend of mine who's a gynecologist in New York. Mm -hmm. And I sent her a patient who was just having persistent vulvar irritation. And it, it looked like a yeast infection, sounded like a yeast infection, uh, Mm -hmm. wasn't, it wasn't bacterial vaginosis. You know, we went back and forth and she was treated for all these things. And I sent her to this friend of mine and uh, the patient was cured. And I said, what did you do? And right. she said, I made a spray. She said, I do this with all of my enigmatic patients who have discomfort uh-huh. of any kind. Right. That I just make a spray that I mix up in my own office, which is like just a small part lidocaine uh-huh. and the rest is saline. And she said, wow. they just find it unbelievably soothing. Mm-hmm. Just basically homeopathic doses of lidocaine. Right. But it just seems to work. And she said, when oh. I have no other... I said, you should, you know, patent this. You should sell yeah. this. Or you could sell this on Goop. But speaking of Goop, we, before we leave, we yeah. have Goop is, of course, Gwyneth Paltrow's uh, right. health, and, health and wellness site. 
Uh, and I love following your Twitter feed, which for anybody mm -hmm. who wants to do, Becky K. Lynn. Mm -hmm. um, the topic came up recently about you know her recommendation of vaginal jade eggs, mm -hmm. which I was harping on for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And I was so excited to see that there was actually legal uh, prosecution yeah. of good right. over right. this issue in California, 10 different uh, county prosecutors went after the company and they were fined $145,000 for basically spewing junk science. Right. Or, right. you know, Most medical that. misinformation. Oh. Yeah. So obviously what we want to tell everybody is don't put jade eggs in your vagina. Right. And certainly not overnight. And don't put quartz uh, eggs in your vagina nope. or anything else that's not designed to be there. Right. Uh, because there can be consequences, of course, right. infections, yeah. and of course, even worst case scenario, toxic shock syndrome. Right. But what are some of the other just out there uh, suggestions and recommendations to women that are just pissing you off? Huh, there's a lot. <laughs> and I walk out of patient rooms sometimes and I'm like, somebody is exploiting people with false claims. And it actually makes me really, really angry. And they're exploiting it for profit because yeah, these jade profit. eggs, of course, I actually looked up the price because I was that curious. Oh, I don't want to know. So, it, well, I'm it's actually, it was, it was more reasonable than I thought, but still it's real money. Uh, yeah. They range from $55 for the quartz to $66 for mm. the jade, uh, yeah. which is ridiculous. So I can think of two examples that I've seen recently that really bothered me. One of my patients is a history of colon cancer and a fear of Western medicine. She refused chemotherapy and radiation, and instead she went to Tijuana, Mexico to get some, I don't even know what it was. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, I feel, I feel bad that somebody is exploiting that or that people don't trust modern medicine because modern medicine, in order to get a medicine approved, it has to go through rigorous scientific mm -hmm. testing. And when you just make claims without science to back it up, and I, I don't fault people in a way because they're not doctors. They can't look at a website and know, is this true or is this not true? So I welcome it when people ask me my opinion on some new fad or some you know essential oil or whatever. Mm -hmm. So that's my second one uh, that really upset me. So one of my neighbors um, had a party, an essential oils party. And um. <laughs> I didn't know what essential oils were. And I'm like, oh, they must make your house smell good. Sure, I'll come to the party. We can all drink wine and we'll smell some oils. So we all sat down. And the, fr the friend of hers got up and was talking about how essential oils cure, you know, pneumonia and essential oils cure headaches and they help with your fertility and how she didn't believe it until her son had a headache. She gave, and I was just like, oh my gosh, there's no science behind this and people believe this stuff. And I looked at like the pamphlet that that she had out and you can spend $700 on essential oils. And it really, really bothers me that I feel really feel like people are being exploited for profit. In but things. those companies are working in a multi-level marketing fashion. Right. So not only are they recruiting people to sell these things to, but they're also recruiting people to then go out and also sell them. So yeah. you know, that's a whole nother issue, but it brings up a good point. Um, obviously, if you're selling something to improve your vaginal tone and musculature that you insert that you could get an infection and die from, mm -hmm. that's very different than if you're saying, okay, an essential oil, if you put it on your head and you have a tension headache, you know, it'll make you go away. Or if you smell right. it, your headache will go away. Right. Obviously there yeah, are headaches yeah. and then there are extreme headaches. And then there's the headache that's the worst headache in your life that you need to rush to the emergency room. Right. So, you know, when I hear about essential oils for aromatherapy purposes during massage, I have no issues with that. Right. And right. I've tried that myself and it's very, you know, pleasing. It's very I think relaxing. That's fine. And there's no health risks to that. So where right. we have a problem is when science is being totally misrepresented or ignored yes. in order to sell products that right. can either do harm or by not getting proper medical therapy, as in the case with a colon cancer patient, right. you know, can actually be fatal uh, right. by not doing that. So anyway, I could talk to you all day. We're going to have to come, have you come back. I think okay. uh, 
one of the other topics I want to discuss with you is debunking the myths about oh, yeah. sex and sexuality and, and GYN. Absolutely. But before I let you go, I've got to ask you the question we ask everybody. Mm-hmm. Aside from this interview, what mm-hmm. was the most unique, different, interesting, or memorable experience you ever had in a ladies' room? So I did have a little time to think about that, mm-hmm. and it's not very exciting, but the mm-hmm. one I could come up with is in my early 20s, I lived in New York City, and I went in, we were out one evening in a restaurant, and I went into the bathroom, and all of the stalls in the bathroom were glass, like the, like you could like see through. right through it, and I was like, hmm, that's weird, <laughs> but what happened <laughs> was when you went into the bathroom and you locked the door, all the glass frosted up. Oh, that's clever. That's very New York. Very clever. I've actually been in hotel rooms that are like upgraded suite type rooms Uh where they have the toilet area separate from the rest of the bathroom, but it's a clear glass door. And I always say this is clearly designed by a man. No woman would have a see-through door on right. the toilet. <laughs> That's just ridiculous. Kind of defeats the purpose. I don't Can know. Can I add one more thing before Absolutely. we go? Absolutely. So, I um, got two more things. Okay. So like you mentioned, I do have a Twitter feed and I try to post interesting articles related to women's sexuality. And that's at Becky K. Lynn. Um, I also have a Facebook page and an Instagram. You can tell I have teenage children who help <laughs> me put all of this up. Um, my Facebook is um, Women's Sex Health MD, mm-hmm. and um, my Instagram is Dr. Becky Lynn. And I do have a YouTube channel also where yeah. I put patient information up there, you know, things that I tell my patients over and over again, just good information about sexual issues. And I did it really for my patients, but I found that it's been very useful for their partners. Mm because we don't get a lot of education on what's normal. So the partner may be like, what's wrong with you? And then the partner can watch the video and go, oh, okay, that's normal. So, Well, so you are also going to be on my YouTube channel because this episode will air as a regular podcast and on our YouTube channel. And I love following your Twitter feed. People could just follow my Twitter feed too because I just you know, uh, retweet a lot of your tweets. Um, yeah. But please follow us. And then, of course, our, pa- our, our I said our patients, our listeners <laughs> often send us questions afterwards. And we mm-hmm. address those questions every week on our Facebook Live uh, video, which I've got to run to and go do right now. Okay. Um, but uh, if I get any questions that are specifically for you, I will send them to you. And we would love to have you back anytime. But thank Thanks you so that. much for sharing all of uh, this great information for people especially about becoming cliterate. Yes. So thanks again. Take care and please tune in next week for In the Ladies Room with Dr. Gunica. That's all we have time for today. But let's keep the conversation going on Twitter or Facebook at Dr. Dunica. And please join us next week for another episode of In the Ladies Room with Dr. Dunica. Real conversations with real women about really intimate topics.